Okay. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Seven Figure Seller Summit. Today, I am thrilled to have a special guest with us, Emma Shermer Tamir. Uh, she's going to teach you guys how to optimize your Amazon product listing to skyrocket your conversions. So, how are you doing, Emma? I'm great. How are you, Gary? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, where are you? Where are you tuning in from today? Emma? I am in Columbia, Missouri, which for those of you that are not that familiar, if you close your eyes and point to the middle of the United States, you'd probably end up fairly close to where I am right now. Awesome. Awesome. Middle America. I love Middle it. America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. And then I'm, I'm still in Japan. So I think one of the, the beauties of, you know, having a virtual event like this is that you can tune in anywhere in the world. So, um, Emma, I, you know, I'm super thrilled to have Emma on. Uh, we actually met in person last year in Hong Kong at a, um, an Amazon event at the global source summit. And I saw that, um, you know, she and her husband, they had a really solid, uh, marketing firm specializing in helping Amazon sellers increase their conversions with improving their Amazon product listings, you know, copywriting, all this good stuff. So I thought that, you know, that why don't we invite her on to help you guys? Cause I know a lot of people, they may be, you know, launching new products or they're looking to optimize their conversion rates. So I thought that, you know, let's invite Emma on to give a, a masterclass on this. So Emma is the co-founder of marketing by Emma. And then she specializes in helping e-commerce businesses boost their sales and build their brands by connecting with their dream customers. So um, before we begin, I just want to make sure that everyone can see us and hear us. So if you're watching and you can see us, can you type in the chat window your name and where you're calling from? Just so that, I, you know, with technology and the fact that we are live, you know, you know stuff happens. But I just want to make sure that uh, that you guys can see us. So if you can let us know. Um, so as we're doing that, uh, so today's training is specifically for Amazon sellers. So Emma has prepared a presentation going through a lot of the, the details of putting together um, a perfect Amazon listing, you know, like very optimized in terms of the, the copywriting and you know, all of the, the details. And then I know, you know, a lot of you guys have challenges with, you know, choosing the appropriate keywords or, um, you know, maybe just writing sales copy in general, like the do's and don'ts. So we're going to try to answer as many of these questions that you submitted as we can. And if you, you guys do have any, any burning questions that you that come up in the middle of the presentation, please type it in the chat window and then I'll see if we can get to that um, before before the end. And this session will last about uh, one hour. OK, so, um, OK, I see a couple people um, are watching us uh, tuning in. So, hey, Trisha from Melbourne, it's good to see you. Um, so yeah, let's, so it's good to know that this is working, um, Trish is <laughs> viewing from Facebook and we're also live on YouTube as well. Okay. So, uh, without further ado, why don't I just turn things over to you, Emma, and then you can start awesome. the show. Thank you so much for having me, Gary. I'm really excited to be here and Gary's right. While I am going to be going into what you need to be doing to write a really well optimized listing. Amazon listing, <clears throat> excuse me, this, a lot of the things that I'm talking about can also apply to any of the other marketing writing that you're doing. So it may not have to follow all of the specific guidelines for Amazon, but if you're thinking in terms of larger concepts, a lot of these things are hopefully, um, elements that you'll be able to use, whether it's writing better emails or your packaging or your website or whatever the case may be. So let's just share the screen and get into the presentation. Excellent. And oh, I wanted to give a quick shout out to a couple other people that just uh, this tuned in. Lorraine from Vancouver, good to see you. Andrew Simmons, uh, Brownwin from Newcastle, Australia, Anon from Gold Coast, Australia, and Mr. Blacks from Melbourne. So welcome, guys. All right, awesome. Emma. 
Got a lot of Australia representation. Yeah, yeah a lot of Aussies. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. So how to create conversion spiking Amazon listings. And the way that I organize this presentation today is I wanted to make sure that I address as many of the questions that you have uh, as I possibly can. So I've woven those into the presentation. And the very first present question was, uh, I kind of distilled it into what is a roadmap for consistent, well-optimized listings? And that's obviously a pretty big question, but hopefully this presentation today will give a framework for all of the different things that you need to be thinking about as you're creating any of the listings that you are going to be creating now or in the future. So as, it, as Gary mentioned, my name's Emma. I co-founded Marketing by Emma in 2016 with my husband, Ares, who is standing to the left of me in that photo. So the first thing you really need to be very conscious of when you are writing for Amazon is that you must think from an SEO perspective as well as a customer perspective. So simply writing something that sounds really good but isn't incorporating the important keywords is not going to perform in the way that you want and need it to. But on the other hand, if you're exclusively focusing on the keywords, which this is an issue that I see more often than the, than the former, which is that it seems to be that a lot of Amazon sellers feel much more comfortable conducting their keyword research and finding all of those keywords. And so then they want to make sure that they're including as many of those as possible. And so it just ends up looking like a big mess and it's not necessarily written in a way that's going to be convincing or compelling or exciting to your potential customers. So here's an example of what not to do. If we look at this product here, uh, it is a great example of keyword stuffing that can really work against what you're trying to achieve. So we don't actually start to begin to learn what this product is until the ninth word. Instead, they're really pushing hard for this unique gifts for various um, ways of calling a man in your life. And if I'm skimming a search results page, then I'm probably not going to make that much effort to read that far in to figure out what this product is. And so if they're appearing on a unique birthday gifts page, perhaps they could look like something interested in, and if I'm just a little bit curious, I may click into it. But you really want to make sure that when you're creating a title, and particularly if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see what, it look, what this uh, title looks like when it truncates on um, just on the search results. This isn't even on mobile. And so you see it, it is giving me very little detail about what this product is. And if your title is one of the few things that will actually compel somebody to click into your listing or not, you need to make sure that you are very clearly articulating what this product is and why it's worth this customer's click. So first and foremost, clearly communicating what the product is. And then second of all, making sure that you're including any of those key differentiators that will help people understand why they should click in your product as opposed to any of the other competitors. So if we were just speaking hypothetically here about this product, let's say that what's really special about this product is, is that it's nine tools in one, whereas many of the other survival tool, multi-tools out there only have five. So you would really want to emphasize that it's nine in one and make that at the very beginning of your title. Alternatively, perhaps what makes this really unique is that it's made of some really strong metal that is also very lightweight. And again, if that's the main differentiator, you want to, to put that front and center, center rather than hiding it away. So some of the other keyword related questions. How many keywords should you put into your listing? Does it depend on the product? 
how do you know when you have enough and how to know what the best keywords are and where to put them. And so I included all of these together because I think they all go towards this common issue that a lot of sellers face, which is trying to understand how to balance the findings that they have when they're conducting their keyword research with creating a listing. Because you have so many different things that you're needing to juggle. You have character limitations, you have selecting your keywords, you want to make sure that you're clearly communicating your product. Uh, and, and then of course, there can be some very attractive keywords that you just, it can be hard to even choose which ones are, are worth putting your focus on. But what's important to remember is, is that with a listing, it's not the same as your packaging where you're going to be ordering a large quantity and then to repackage your products would be both difficult and expensive. With your listing, you're, you have the ability to continue to tweak it. And so it's not that if you put your listing up there, you can never change it again. So a lot of these questions may have somewhat unsatisfying answers. Like there is no magic number of keywords to incorporate. And part of that's also because a lot of products will have very different search results. There are some products and you conduct your keyword research and you may have a really short list of words to be working with. Whereas other products, you could have a list of hundreds plus keywords that all seem like good contenders. And so then it's a matter of digging a little bit deeper and trying to think about things like looking at the search volume, but not getting completely um, carried away in just going after those high search volume words if they're not relevant or if they're very highly competitive. So for example, a word, like if we're thinking of this survival tool, a word like tool probably has hundreds of thousands even of, of search results. I have no idea, but I would imagine that it's very high because it's a root word for a lot of other words. And so if you were wanting to focus your efforts on tool, which it's not the best example in the world, but let's say that, it, it is tool and it doesn't really totally explain what this product is. In that case, you are putting a lot of effort into incorporating a word that is not even going to attract the right kind of buyers to your page. So you want to be thoughtful of what is the buyer intent behind every keyword? And so just because a keyword is very attractive doesn't necessarily mean that it is relevant to your product. And it's much better to have those really relevant keywords, particularly in the front part of your listing, because you do have the back end where you can put words that are either a little bit less relevant, that don't fit naturally into your listing, or you just don't have space for. And so the front end, you should really be thinking about those keywords that are very relevant and that also flow really well naturally in language. So if you have a five, like let's go back here for a second to this unique give birthday gifts for men, dad, husband, there's no way that you can use those keywords strung together that way in a sentence that makes sense or is grammatically correct. So rather than trying to shove all that long I don't even know if that's a true search term, but hypothetically speaking, if it was, it's better not to try to fit all of that into the title. Instead, choose another keyword and then put put either some of those words elsewhere in the listing and then what you couldn't fit in the listing itself, putting it in the back end, again, if it's relevant. Um, let's just make sure that we addressed all these questions. So how to know when you have enough. I would stop thinking about keywords in terms of quantity because it's really about knowing what are the best keywords and not being so focused on saying, for example, your title should have X number of keywords, your each bullet should have five keywords, whatever the case may be. Because also some products that have a more that are more matured and developed categories 
you're, you have all sorts of very interesting longer tail keywords, which if you're not familiar, there's short term keywords are one, two word phrases, longer term keywords are three, five, seven, those ones that they can start to be a little bit awkward, but they're really great for a couple of reasons. One being that those longer tail keywords typically include shorter tail keywords within them. So it's sort of like a two for one deal where you're still including those higher volume, shorter tail keywords, but you're really focusing on these less competitive, more relevant long tail keywords. So make sure to do your homework. Pay attention also, sometimes keywords can look really great as but they're not necessarily the best fit for the front end. So make sure that you're not incorporating misspellings or other languages or brand names, particularly on Amazon. A lot of brands have really unassuming names. So it's very easy to accidentally include a competitor's brand name in your listing and you want to be aware not to do that. Make sure that you're really writing things in a way that are that is natural uh, and that you're not just trying to shove a bunch of keywords. So this is the first bullet uh, of the of that survival tool that we were looking at. And you see they're just really pushing hard with this gift idea. So it's a unique gift. They say all the people that you can give it to. And then they say all the occasions that you can give it give it for. And there are times when it may be relevant to want to speak about the giftability of a product, but also as we were talking about earlier, where it's not necessary to write your listing, put it up there and just never touch it again. Instead, you can seasonally update your listing if that seems necessary so that when it's within a range where people would be purchasing Christmas gifts, you can mention that it's great for Christmas rather than leaving that it's great for Christmas, Father's Day, Valentine's Day, etc. all year round. How do you capture a prospective buyer's interest in the first few words and successfully differentiate yourself from other sellers? So this is what I took it to mean and I, I hope that this is what the asker uh, was was intending with this question is really referring to the title, though it's possible that that could also be with the bullets. So we'll speak about both. So as I mentioned, with the title, you want to be very clear about what the product is, and then you want to make sure that you're including all of those important details, especially towards the beginning of of the title so that you are ensuring that when somebody's looking at, at the search results, regardless of whether it's on a computer or on their phone, they're going to know exactly what it is. That's the most important. If people are confused about what it is, there's a high likelihood that they are not going to click into it. So making sure that you're clear about what it is and then any of those special features like we spoke about earlier. And then for the bullets, you want to do a few things. First and foremost, I really encourage you to push yourself to make each bullet focused on one main point. I know it can be very tempting and difficult to figure out how to combine all of this information into only five bullets, but your bullets are not the only place that you have to share information about your product. So don't feel like you have to put everything into your bullets. And the first bullet in particular, it's really what I would, would suggest doing is thinking about what is the main problem or the main benefit that your product is addressing and then making sure to make that front and center so that when somebody looks at your first bullet, they're very clear about exactly what it is that they're getting. So if we were to rewrite this title and the first bullet, this is something that we might write with the little bit of information that we have based upon the, the um, listing that was on Amazon. So next, let's talk about photos. And I love, I love this quote for a very specific reason. So there are always two people in every picture, the photographer and the viewer. 
And in this case, the reason why I included it is because you're the photographer and your customers are the viewer. And if we're all looking at this photo, there's a high likelihood that we're all getting a very different message from it. Some of us might look at this photo and reminisce about a past vacation that we took with families. Others might see this and think about the vacation that they had to cancel because the world went into lockdown. And others will see this and think, wow, it's so sunny in that picture and here it's gloomy and how much I would love to have a sunny day. We're all going to be telling ourselves different stories about this photo. You know, there's that cliched expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, that's fantastic because it can really communicate a lot. But if you're not incorporating a little bit of text into your images, then you are allowing your customers to interpret the photo in whatever way that they they choose to. So you want to be really careful when you're using any photos, but particularly lifestyle photos, that if you're not incorporating a little bit of text, then you are allowing the customer to call the shots rather than making sure that they're getting whatever message you intended when you chose to invest in creating that particular image. So use words to supercharge your photos. If we look at the right hand side here, we have uh, a few images from a KitchenAid listing. And one of the things that really stuck out to me about this picture is that if the third picture in particular is they show this attachment to the KitchenAid, which is a spiralizer that allows you to make noodle noodles out of vegetables. And that's a pretty cool attachment. However, the problem is, is that this product does not actually come with that attachment. However, by just including a picture like that, I would say that there are definitely people that will look at that picture and will assume that this product comes with a spiralizer and will get it home and will be very disappointed to find out that it did not come with a spiralizer. Whether they would choose to return it or not, I don't know. However, if they included a little bit of text to say that purchasing a spiralizer is, some, is an attachment that they can get, obviously with a little bit better phrasing, then suddenly, not only is it clarifying that it doesn't come with a spiralizer, but it very well may help to upsell another product to actually make this a, a bigger purchase. So think being thoughtful about how you combined images and text together is something that you should all be doing. So you can have the most beautiful photos and be the most well-known brand, but it's really easy to forget this important detail and either present information that's confusing, fail to communicate the message that you're wanting to, or even miss out on other sales opportunities. But when I'm saying including text, you also want to be careful not to overdo it. So I see a lot of times sellers will create these very nice looking infographics, but they will be completely overcrowded with text. And so that's not what you should be going for. Instead, try to imagine a really attractive magazine ad where there's a great picture and then there's a very short phrase. And that's the type of images that you want to be creating. People shouldn't have to zoom in to read what you're writing. Emphasizing benefits is a great thing to do with your photos. It's, it's possible that people looking at your images may not even be reading the rest of your listing all that carefully. So it can be a great place to emphasize those benefits as well as present those important key features, particularly those key features that may not be easily understood by just reading about them. So some things are much easier to understand when you have text and imagery together than just one or the other. And so if we look back at that same photo, suddenly by including a little bit of text, you may notice now that uh, one of the people in this photo is carrying a water bottle in her hand. And so even though the main focus of this image has nothing to do with water, 
you can still make sure that people are thinking about how this water bottle can be such a great travel companion as you're exploring the world. Though perhaps this example is a little bit less relevant as most people are not traveling for the moment. So put your customers first. Get another round of questions that I think all end up relating to the idea of customers. So what is the most important factor in a listing? I would say that your most important factor in a listing, and this is going to be probably a little bit unsatisfying of an answer, is really your customers. You need to be very clear on who your customers are, what their problems are, what you're trying to solve, and the clearer that you can be about who your customers are, and I mean specifically. So a lot of times I ask people who their target market is, and they'll say something very broad, like parents between the ages of 25 and 45. That is so nonspecific that it's not really helpful. And I understand that as a business, you want to sell to as many people as you can possibly sell to. And so it can be very tempting to keep that net as wide as possible with the thought being that you don't want to exclude potential customers by getting that specific. However, typically that is going to work against you because if you are keeping it that general, then you're not really able to take a specific stand and make a strong argument and be compelling in a way that's going to really resonate with your true target market. So thinking a little bit more specific, like if we're talking about parents, perhaps your target market is uh, millennial parents who both of the parents uh, are working professionals and that is still not quite as specific as I would encourage you to go, but even just that little bit of narrowing helps to define who it is that you're selling to, but what it also does is it helps you overcome a very challenging obstacle that everybody experiences, whether they are the most, uh, you know, have, have been writing for years or have never done professional writing. And that is sitting down and staring at a blank screen is very intimidating and it can be really difficult to get past that. But when you have a very clear idea of who your customer is and who you're trying to communicate with, then it can change that experience a little bit so that you're not simply writing to a screen, but you're imagining talking to a person. And even trying to think about if you were face to face with somebody, like imagining that you had a store and you were selling to somebody in a store, what would you say to them? What would be the types of things that you'd be really excited for them to know? What would be the things that you'd imagine they'd get really excited about? So thinking about interactions like that and trying to capture that in-person element as you sit down to write your listing. How to trigger emotional touch points to get them excited and hit add to cart. So again, that really goes back to first and foremost, having a very clear understanding of who your customer is. So you can't trigger emotional touch points if you're not really being bold enough to think about who you're truly selling to. But once you have a clear idea of who you're selling to, then you can also get a much clearer idea about what their problems are, what their fears are, what their concerns are. Why are they going onto Amazon or onto Google to search for a product like yours? What is that uncomfortable situation that they want to remedy with uh, by purchasing a product like yours? And so thinking about that and having not only an understanding of who your customer is, but the experience they're having that's led up to them needing to fix it, and then helping to also paint the picture of what their life can be like with that product in their life. So it's not just really uh, getting and digging into that pain point, but also helping to 
clarify how this product that you're selling can really help to solve those problems and make their lives better. So thinking in terms of benefits, not simply features. I am taking over an existing product and was looking to appoint a UK listing photography company. Being and selling in the UK, does it matter of location? So the reason that I grouped this with the customer section of this conversation is because localization and marketing are very important because as we're speaking about, it's not simply uh, selling to some some group of people, you have to really understand who your customers are. And part of understanding that is even understanding the cultural references and the influencers and all of those things that it's much harder to have a firm grasp of when you're not living in a place. And I've lived abroad, so I know that when I have spent longer periods of time outside of the United States, I've felt disconnected from what's going on in this country. So in those periods of time, I was less comfortable writing for American customers because I felt like I didn't know what everybody was talking about and what all the YouTube videos that they were watching and just also what it felt like to be somewhere. And then if we're going to talk a little bit more generally, like let's say something like a red lipstick, it's highly likely that uh, using, let's let's say that we want to make some cultural reference. And in the United States, one of the first people that comes to mind when you think of red lipstick would be Marilyn Monroe. But in every country, they might have their own icon that is evoked when you think about red lipstick. And so even those little nuances can be really important when you're trying to create impactful marketing. So I would say if your photographer is not based in the UK, then you would at least want somebody that is based in the UK to be able to help with some of that creative ideation or at least being able to look at things and make sure that it makes sense. Because even if there's not, even if there are not words on it, it's still people, people, people can sense when there's a disconnect. So you want to be mindful of that and be aware of being sensitive to what people expect of, of, of marketing and from their brands in a particular place. So let's take a look at two brands uh, that one does a really great job of communicating with their customers and the other doesn't so much. So we have Elf and their Poreless Putty Primer versus Tatcha the Silk Canvas. It's been said that Elf is a dupe for the Tatcha Primer. The price difference is pretty substantial. So the Poreless Putty Primer is $8 and Tatcha's Silk Canvas Primer is $52. So if Elf is the knockoff of Tatcha and they're and YouTubers all over the world are saying that these are nearly identical, it's Tatcha's responsibility to help communicate to me as the customer why it is worth me spending so much more money to purchase their primer which has even a little bit less uh, product than, than Elf's. And let's look and see whether they do, do a good job of this. Uh, so firstly, we see that Elf's bullets are organized in a way that is much more customer friendly. So they're using those all caps headers to each bullet, which helps customers be able to quickly skim and look and see what each bullet is about. Because a lot of times when we're shopping for products as consumers, we have one or two points that we know we must have in that product for it to even be worth our time to continue researching. So maybe I'm somebody that I only buy cruelty-free cosmetics. And in that case, I'm going to immediately be looking for cruelty-free 
Elf makes it very clear. It's their third bullet. It's impossible to miss. Tatcha is also cruelty free, but my eyes have to work much harder to find it. And it looks like it is in the fifth bullet, uh, kind of wedged in the middle there. So Elf is talking about that, like what this does for my skin. It's talking about how it works. It's speaking about their great ingredients and then just what their mission is as a brand. Whereas Tatcha, I think what's happening here, and this is actually really common with larger brands on Amazon, which is that they're, they're assuming that people looking at their product page already know who they are and already know what this product is and don't really care to read about it. And that is a huge missed opportunity for them. But what it also means is that it's a really great opportunity for smaller sellers that may not have that brand equity that either of these brands have, which is that even if you look and say you're competing against these huge titans, you're not competing with them in as fierce of a competition as you would be if you were on the same shelf. On Amazon, you have the ability to really understand how to do things the right way that a lot of these larger brands either don't have the time or know how to do. So I look at a lot of listings and a lot of the very big brands are the worst offenders when it comes to not only not having well-written listings, but not even doing much in the way of keyword optimization. So this product, if we look at the third bullet, it says it features natural active ingredients like real silk, pink and gold pearl, and Tatcha's signature anti-aging superfood, Trinity Hadase 3, which Tatcha is a Japanese brand. They're a luxury brand. None of that's really coming through in, in their bullets. In this third bullet, there's a little bit of an allusion to it. And I would say that most likely these ingredients are the reason why they're choosing to charge $52. However, they're just kind of laying those ingredients out there like we should know what those are, what they mean when it comes to putting them on our skin and that we should just be instantly impressed by them. But instead, that's not really what's happening. I read that, I say, okay, well, I could put some pearls on my face, but I don't know that that would really make much of a difference. And I could spend $7.99 with e.l.f., have the same experience, have more money to spend on other makeup or whatever it is that I want to spend it on. So if we look at e.l.f.'s A plus content, they also do a really great job with this. They are very minimal with the text they're using, but all of the text that they are using is very impactful. They're cross-promoting some of their other products. They're really speaking about what they stand for. They're talking about the, the benefits of this particular primer. They're using that great social proof, the primer that broke the internet. I love that. So it's a, this is really, really solid. This is Tatcha's description. It's one, poorly written sentence. And so this is just lazy. It's not respecting the customer and it's not giving the customer the information that, that they had, had they given them, a customer would very likely say, you know what, it is worth it to me to pay that extra money. But instead they're leaving me wanting more and I'm going with Elf. Next. Mind your P's and Q's. Attention to detail is of utmost importance when you want to look good. So before we get into these questions, the reason that I feel it's so important to speak about things like proper grammar and spelling and, and all of those little details is because when you're selling online, you have very minimal opportunity to be building trust with your customers. And so even the smallest error can create an opportunity for you to lose some of that trust. And even if a customer is not looking at your listing and trying to find those errors, it may just be something that happens in the subconscious of their mind. And they read it and it sounds a little bit weird or it, it, it reads kind of funny and it makes them take pause for a moment. And you do not want to create 
an opportunity for those feelings or for them to pause and, and be pulled out of your listing. Because what that does is that gives your competitors that are advertising on your product page a good chance of winning that customer's click. But it's also, it may seed some doubts of whether you are truly what you say you are. There have been quite a few uh, news reports over the last few years of issues with counterfeit goods and products that are not meeting safety specifications that they need to be. And so customers are becoming more and more savvy to that. And, and so it's very important that you make sure that everything that you're putting out there is showing how seriously you take your products and your business. So it's not simply that it's a little typo and, and who cares. You want to respect your business and you want to respect your customers enough to avoid those little errors that could create big problems for your bottom line. So the next set of questions, how often should I review and amend the listing? And should I touch the listing at all if it is converting well? So how often should I review and amend the listing? I would say that's really a question of a few things. One is being aware of what's happening in your category and even more specifically than that in your competitive space. Because let's say, for example, that you were selling a product for the keto diet. If you were selling keto products a few years ago, you had a pretty, that was a pretty niche diet that not a lot of people were aware of. So probably there were fewer search terms, there were not as many people shopping for things. The, there were not as many different types of products, maybe products that were meant for something else were being used for people that were that were interested in, in keto diet. And so at that time, your keywords may have been more focused on paleo or zone diet or low carb. And so as the keto diet became more and more popular, just even from a keyword perspective, there has been a maturity in both the amount of phrases as well as the types of things that people are searching. And then from a writing perspective, there is a whole group of people that is more educated about some different types of products and things in the keto diet that perhaps in the past, you would need to do a little bit more customer education. So you wanna be mindful of things like that. You also want to be mindful of seasonality. So like when we spoke about that first example with the survival tool and trying to think about how, rather than adding all of the holidays, focusing on one holiday at a time and even maybe up to updating an image throughout the year about the gift ability, but making it relevant to that particular gifting uh, season. Should I touch the listing at all if it is converting well? I would say that really depends upon what you consider to be converting well and what your goals are. A lot of times we work with people and they say, my listing is converting pretty well and it, it's selling and I'm happy about that, but I feel like it could be selling more. And so in that case, it's just a matter of if you want to invest the time and effort into seeing what the full potential of your product is. And when you are trying to test some of those things, you can even do it in pieces, you can do A-B testing, so you don't necessarily need to scrap the entire listing and start fresh, but it is something that you may want to explore if you feel like there are more conversions to be had. And just in general, you should be constantly keeping an eye on what your competitors are doing, um, what sorts of keywords, what, what that data is saying, and making sure that you're not falling behind. Because what I also see is a lot of times we have clients and we help them create their listings and then they say, 
uh, all of our competitors are copying us. So they're always having to find new ways of staying ahead, even with their listings. And so you could say, okay, well, they're copying. Wouldn't it be better to just try to get them to, not to copy them? And they find that it's more worth their energy to find new ways to continue to keep themselves fresh and ahead of the game. So you want to be thinking about all of those things with your listings. And I would encourage you to never consider your listing as done and then it can just operate on itself for the rest of time. At some point, whether that's in three months, six months, or three years, it will require you to give it some attention. And I know that a lot of you said you're not brand registered, but for those of you that are, when we're talking about something like A plus content, if you would have done EBC a few years ago, the available modules for you would be really limited and would be very boxy and don't look particularly good. However, now the A plus modules that are available they look very nice and the design has come a long way. So even just thinking about that and how Amazon continues to change and make sure that you are staying up to date with those. Uh, I'm gonna skip that. So double, triple, quadruple check what it is that you're putting out there. Read it out loud, ask yourself, does it make sense? Are you using familiar language? It's really, I see this happen in, in one of two ways. One is you are using technical terms that most of your customers would not understand, or you're not using specific enough language that customers would expect to see from a product like yours. So if you're selling a yoga product for advanced yoga practitioners, and you're not using certain yoga terminology, then they may think that you are not really the expert in yoga and they may go to one of your competitors instead. So being aware of all of those subtleties, not just from a spelling and grammar side, but also making sure that there's a connection between the language you're using and the customers that you're trying to sell to. Don't tell them what it is, but rather why they need it. So we we're just speaking about the keto diet. Here is an example of a listing that on the surface, it looks pretty good. You see that they have their bullets sort of formatted like we spoke about, though they could be better. However, when we dig in a little bit, we see that they're making a lot of st statements about the features of this product, and they're really not doing anything to help communicate why that matters to me. So anytime that you wanna share a detail about your product, ask why does that matter and it will help you to really dig into the benefit of what a particular feature of a product truly is so for example if we look at the second well even just the first bullet premium grass-fed ingredients so it's telling me that it has grass-fed ingredients and that it tastes great and feels right but it's not really telling me why that's important. And furthermore, this is a fairly expensive product. It's $40. I know there are cheaper op keto creamers out there. So I would imagine that this grass fed element is one of the main reasons why they're so much more expensive, but they're not telling me why that matters to me. So they could justify their price just like with how Tatcha should have, but they're not. And similarly, if you go down the list, clean MCT oil, they don't explain what that means or why that matters to me. Um, they say that it's keto approved and that it's sweetened with um, superlose, which is the ultimate keto sugar replacement. They sort of allude to why, what it is, but again, they're not really telling me why. Why is it uh, the best sugar replacement? Is it that it tastes better? Is it that it's not, it said no blood sugar spikes, but there are plenty of other non-sugar uh, sweeteners that also don't cause blood sugar spikes. So that's not really giving me the full picture. And we see that with each of the bullet points and we see that with their description as well. Another odd point about this description is that the flavor that they have in the EBC is actually different than the flavor that I clicked on. But what I find even more odd is that they have three flavors and their A plus content would be a perfect space for them to show us what those three flavors are and perhaps 
I am really attracted to the original flavor, but my husband would prefer the, uh, the, the sweet vanilla. And so if they're showing me all of those, then, and maybe making my mouth water with some tempting descriptions, they'd have the opportunity of perhaps selling me a couple of containers of this creamer instead of the one. So find the benefit by saying, why does this matter? And keep asking why. Sometimes you ask, why does this matter? And you get to an answer that sounds satisfying, but you may not be all the way there yet. So continue to ask why until you feel really satisfied that you say, yes, this is what, why this truly matters to a customer. This is that, that detail that is going to clearly communicate how their life will be better with this product in it. And then it's not to say that features aren't important, it's just that you should use your features to support your claims. So rather than making your features front and center and the main reason that somebody should buy your product, say this is the benefit and this is, we're able to say this because of these features. So it's having them work together, not just focusing on one or the other. And now we have a few listings that have been submitted for a little bit of a teardown. So I guess this would be a good opportunity if anybody has any questions before we move into this. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, yeah, Emma, this is excellent. And uh, we had one earlier question from Andrew. And then in terms of the bullets, he said that he's seen listings with six and seven bullets. How does that occur? Do you, any insight on that? So that, that the, the only way that you can get those, it really depends upon your category. So not all categories can get those extra bullets. Uh, I think a lot of times they're for apparel, I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. And I know it can be really tempting to say, oh, I want six bullets. I want seven bullets. Five bullets is enough. You should be able to communicate everything that you need to within five bullets. So if you have that option for your category, that's great. But I still don't know that it's it. it creates any more opportunity than what five bullets can because five bullets is a lot like if you you know on amazon I, I think a lot of people and this is something that i didn't mention and that is worth talking about is characters and what you're allowed and not allowed so some of that will be dependent upon your category but like for your bullets a lot of categories allow you to have up to 500 characters per bullet and so that can be very tempting to say, okay, I'm gonna use 500 characters for every single bullet. Well, from a customer perspective, that's a terrible idea because that's going to create these incredibly bulky paragraphs that are very difficult to navigate and very overwhelming. And most people are gonna look at that and say, no, thank you. I do not wanna make the effort to read that. Also, a lot of what I've seen is that after about a thousand characters, in your bullets, though the rest of those keywords don't even get indexed. So it can be like I've seen some people that in the fourth and fifth bullets, they just have a big string of keywords. And it's possible that those are not even getting indexed. They're just making their bullets look really undesirable to their customers. Um, then it's also one other thing is while, while your bullets, again, are very tempting for the keywords, just keeping in mind that they are not the only place to include keywords. So you don't have to get every single thing into your bullets. Um, but if we're, if you're imagining, I, I'm, I was interrupting myself. So what I had originally wanted to say with this question was when let's, let's think off Amazon for a minute and you're going to your favorite website and you're looking at the product description for a pro for a product like yours you're most likely not seeing five lengthy bullets and a long description. You're probably seeing a few very short bullets and a few short paragraphs, and then maybe some other supporting information about the business, about their shipping and return policies, all those things that you can communicate on, on a website that you can't communicate on Amazon. So if you're 
thinking about the customer experience with this, then having six, seven bullets is pretty far away from the experience that customers have elsewhere. So unless you have a product that it, that absolutely demands it, I would say there are other ways of using your energy that would be better spent. Excellent. And Emma, just in the interest of time, um, <laughs> yes. would you like to go ahead and go through the listing teardown first and then we can save the, the remaining questions until the end? Sure, yes. I just looked at the clock and realized that time is chugging along. Okay, yes. so this is the first listing and Let's take a moment here uh, for a few things. So this is what you, this is the main image, the title, and there is only one bullet here. So already we have a lot of problems. I know I was saying six, seven may not be necessary, but certainly one partial bullet is particularly um, is particularly problematic because I'm looking at all of this and I'm left with a lot of questions. I'm wondering how many um, of these badges come in a set? It, I could count them, but I can't be certain that, like, is this trying to show me that there are five badges or that there are 10? It's not really clear. I would want to know a lot more about that. It says 32 millimeters. I don't know what is 32 millimeters. It says solid black. Um, however, not the entire product isn't solid black. It looks like some of it is either clear or white that attaches to the ID. So you want to be thinking from the most basic point and then going and taking that further. So we won't go into all of this. Let's look at the the rest of the photos. We have some interesting showing there's a 360 degree and alligator clip that it's uh, expanding. And then they have some of these nice lifestyle images. But all of these images would be much more impactful if rather than having to rely on little arrows, we had a little bit of text to communicate things because I'm not, it's not immediately clear to me why it's so important that the alligator clip rotates by 360 degrees. Is this a unique design of this particular product where all of the competitors fail? And if so, what problem does that cause? Because if I'm somebody that's had a lot of these in the past and I felt incredibly frustrated by a clip that doesn't that doesn't have a full 360 rotation, then this could be a great selling point. So you wanna be thinking about all of those little details and communicating it very clearly to, to your customers, whether those that have had that unfortunate experience or those that would, would love to know that this solves a problem that they would have if they went with one of your other competitors. So some of the other things that I kind of underlined here, um, Stylish unisex design, I'm not sure that that's the best way of describing this product. In fact, if it's all black, I would say maybe one of the key design features is that it's actually quite subtle. So it blends into any of your outfits without being really eye-catching because maybe some people don't want to draw attention to it. Uh, it says it's a super long extending cord which is fine to say, and it says how long it is, but I don't have any reference point for whether that is longer than other badge holders. I would maybe want to provide some additional details to help uh, explain that to me. Also, this is an investment you won't regret. I wouldn't really consider this to be an investment necessarily. It's a it's a, a rather small purchase, but something else that I think is worth considering, who is purchasing a pack of these in multiples? Is this something that an individual is purchasing and then they have, they like, they just want to have a lot of them? Or is this perhaps something that if I have an office or a hospital or something, I'm purchasing for my staff? And in that case, then you would want to make sure that your product description and your bullets are really focusing on who's the actual 
person making that purchasing decision. So whether it's that they don't have to worry about their, like that this will look good with any of the uniforms of anybody that works at their office, whether it's that it's a great deal, whether that it's very reliable, um, whatever the case may be, you wanna be thinking about all of those things. Next listing. Um, this listing has some great potential, but would really benefit from going back to the when we were talking about asking why. So it tells me all of these great features, but it's not telling me why that matters. So designed on a triangle structure. It says the bag stands up and can be opened without falling over. But the way that this is presented is presented so that you have to understand attention is in very short supply. And so you want to say something really uh, that will be will grab my interest at the beginning rather than waiting until the end. So I would argue that designed on a triangle structure is a situation of this is the feature of the product. And the fact that it stands up and in other words, doesn't fall over, which could be a really frustrating problem that this product solves, is sort of tucked away at the end. So if I'm just skimming these bullets and I see design on a triangle structure, I might say, okay, whatever. And then I may not even get to that other part. So you want to make sure that you make the those really important benefits and, and addressing those problems right front and center. Um, made of top quality water resistant material, why does that matter? Ergonomically designed to hug your body, why does that matter? Based on improved from the popular Evernote abrasives, why does it matter? We look at these images and again, we find ourselves in a similar situation as the last listing where I'm not entirely sure what you're trying to communicate with these. There is one image that's using a little bit of text, but I, I think it's a little bit heavy as far as the text goes, and you could communicate the same idea with fewer words, and then you could make the text a little bit bigger, and it would be, a, it would be just that little bit more convincing. But with the image with the water bottle and all of these products, I would imagine that it's trying to show its different pockets or that it holds a lot, but again, it's not telling me this bottom middle image. I have no idea what that's showing. So being thoughtful about what you're really trying to demonstrate with your photos, and then even if it's totally clear to you because you know your product inside and out, you have to remember that your customers don't. And so you need to make it as clear to them as it is to you. Uh, similarly, with the bullets, you want to be focusing a lot more on the benefits. You make a lot of statements like this is this laptop messenger bag designed for the removable dividers. So it's very you focused on the product and it's not really at all focused on the customer and why these things matter and what's so great about it. Um, designed for plenty of room with padded laptop sleeve. I would want to know how, how much room there is in there, uh, which, which isn't included. I don't see dimensions anywhere. So that's the case when features would be more important to include. So thinking about all of those little things, it's really, really important. And just because it's clear to you about why you should be making this statement and what it means, it's very likely not clear to your customers. So then we have, I think this is the last one. First of all, the title. Um, it says grow bags a lot in it. There's no um, evidence to suggest that repetition helps you index better. So all of the times that you see grow bags repeated here, you could be including other more relevant words. Um, so I, I would say be thoughtful about the words that you're using in your title and making sure that yes, you are using keywords, but that you're stringing them together in a way that is helping to communicate what your product is uh, without just looking like a list of keywords. And we get into the bullets and they're a little bit confusing at times. So durable vegetable grow bags for growing in limited space. What does that mean? When you say limited space, what would be the situation that I would need um, 
that I would need these vegetable grow bags. Help me, help me to better understand what I'm weighing my options are. Is it that I'm used to having this tiny little pot and then I need to be thinking about which which of the my favorite vegetables I can plant? And so I don't need to be so cutthroat about that. Or is it addressing something else? Help make that clear. Um, the next bullet, made from eco-friendly, non-woven, BPA-free, breathable fabric. Um, so that the first part is talking about how the materials of this bag are uh, really high quality. And my assumption when I was reading that is that this means that there are not going to be any issues of chemicals getting into the vegetables that I'm growing. However, then you continue reading and it starts talking about how this helps healthy root systems. So when we spoke earlier about how to focus your bullets, you want to make sure that you're only addressing one key point in your bullet points. And so that particular bullet, it would perhaps be better to make it about the materials themselves and then have a second or sorry, a third, the third bullet be about how this in like is designed to encourage and help grow really healthy plants. Cause those are two separate things. Uh, similarly for the description, we have a lot of that where there's a statement and then something else that's, that, that feels like it's unrelated. So we have the eco-friendly non-woven BPA, so very similar to how it was in the bullets. And then once again, it's talking about root systems. And it, it's really interesting the way that it's talking about this air root pruning and all of this. However, I'm needing to read this whole paragraph to try to figure out what that means and why it matters. And what it is ultimately telling me is that it means that there I can grow more vegetables and that the vegetables I will grow are going to be healthier. So that I shouldn't have to read all the way to the end of a paragraph to figure it out. We should make that front and center. And I would argue that that's even one of the key benefits of this pro product. And so you want to make that really clear. And with your description, even if you don't have A plus content, you can still use basic HTML tags to organize your information. And so thinking about how you can use some bolded headers and even um, some short bulleted lists to organize your information in a way that's going to be engaging and interesting and approachable for customers. Uh, this is just sort of a summary of everything. I can send Gary the this presentation if you would just like to be able to look at this a little bit more carefully. This is a listing that we helped create and launch actually last spring, and it stayed in the top 100 uh, to toys and games all summer last year. And now that it's warm out, it's back up to uh, when I snapped out of this, it was number one. I think now it's maybe number three. Anyway, it's doing incredibly well. And it a lot of that has to do with uh, making sure that they're really communicating the clear benefits of this product. So if you'd like to take a look at that as well. Um, and then this is a link for the free worksheet that I put together. So if you're not really... If you're feeling a little bit lost about how to um, even ask the right questions about your customers, about your competitors, about your products, this worksheet has a lot of questions to get you thinking. But don't take those questions and say, okay, these I just need to answer these as quickly as possible and I'm done. No, these are questions that you should use to not only answer now, but to continue to revisit and think more and more deeply about, but also use them to figure out what other questions you may be needing to ask as well. So you can either hold your phone up uh, with the camera and it over the QR code and it will take you right there, or you can go to marketing by emma.com slash Gary to get that free worksheet. I hope I ran through those fast enough. I know we're a little over with time, so awesome. I apologize. <laughs> no, this is uh, this is excellent, Emma. Uh, I think it was a very thorough analysis, especially with the life 
uh, tear down of the listings. I think that's super valuable for the people that submit it. And uh, I know you got to run, but do you have time for just like a couple? Quick oh, yeah, de no, definitely. I was more concerned that we were going over on your side. So I'm here to answer as many questions as people have. Awesome. OK, so um, we had a question from Mr. Blacks. Hi, Emma. Do you recommend putting your brand name in the heading or I assume title or leave it out? Does Amazon allow this? So Amazon's technical rule is that your brand name should be at the very beginning. A lot of times you can get away with not having it as the very first word if you put it at the end or if it's in your title somewhere. So I would say see if you can, it, particularly if you're not yet a well-established brand and because so many people are searching on mobile, if you can get away with not having your brand name at the very beginning of your title, I would say that it's better not to because then you can use that space to in, do what we were speaking about earlier. Also, you know, you want to be mindful of what your brand name is because some brand names are either very unrelated to the product that's being sold or they're they just don't really sound like a brand name. And so that's another reason why it may be worth putting it more towards the end uh, rather than making it front and center. Right. That makes sense. And then uh, Andrew had a question. Do keywords get indexed from A plus content? So this is a great question. From what I know, they do not get indexed by Amazon. Uh, from what I know, they may get indexed by Google. What does for sure get indexed by Google that's sort of interesting and definitely worth doing is your, you can uh, provide alt, alt image text for your images in A+. And so that definitely does get indexed by Google. So you might be saying, okay, well, what would be the reason for upgrading my listing to A+, if that content isn't being indexed? However, even though a lot of times your product, your old HTML product description won't be visible still, that still does get indexed whether or not you have, um, even if it's not visible with your A+. And so you don't have to give up on those keywords um, and you can still be doing the indexing that you need to do. You just want to be a little bit thoughtful that it may not be getting indexed by Amazon itself. I find that a little bit weird. I, it's odd to me that they would be giving all of these brand uh, benefits for brand registered brands and not index A+. But from all of the research and testing I've done, that seems to be the case as of right now. Makes sense. Thank you. And I had a question. Um, or earlier in your presentation, you talked a little bit about, you know, the, the mobile, you know, customer experience. I'm curious in terms of mobile versus desktop, like what's your take on, you know, when you're optimizing your product listing? Like, I, I mean, because there seems to be more and more people, you know, using Amazon on mobile now. So, oh, yeah. Huge yeah. numbers of, of searches are at the very least originating on mobile. And so, you know, if you think about it, like, let's say you're out on a walk and you are walking your dog and you run out of treats. Well, as we all are, maybe you're going to forget to, to buy more treats or to add them to the list when you get home. So maybe you'll pause, sit down on a bench and just go ahead and order them right then and there. Maybe that's not the best example. But what I mean is, you know, people have the opportunity to take care of something in the moment. And so when you're thinking about that, you want to make sure that you're very clear for those people that are on mobile that are probably trying to make a quick decision. And so you want to help make that decision as quick and seamless as possible. So thinking about, again, what are those key details that somebody has to know, but also being aware of things like um, your images are going to be smaller. So if you're using a lot of text, that's not going to be very readable. The title is going to be truncated. There's not a hard and fast character cutoff, but depending upon, 
I don't even know exactly what factors. It, it tends to um, truncate somewhere around 60 to 80, 90 characters or so. And so thinking about if your title is going to get truncated on mobile, what will be visible and making sure that that really important information is included earlier in the title. So even when you're on mobile, it's visible. Uh, you also, the description typically appears before the bullets on mobile. So in the past, I think it was common belief that nobody read your description. So you could either copy and paste what you had in your bullets in your description, or you could just put a huge list of keywords, or you could just leave it blank because it didn't really matter. And that's not the case because if somebody is opening your listing and then they're seeing a blank description, are they going to make the effort to keep scrolling? Potentially not. But also, you know, the bullets, I think, get this sort of glorified status and the description is thought of as a little bit of a throwaway. But I love the description because you can call the shots on exactly how you want to format your information, whereas your bullets, you're confined to writing five bullets. So if you have a, a topical product, you know, some sort of skincare or something, and you have some of these really star ingredients that you're so excited about, there's not a good way of highlighting those in the bullets. You can speak generally about your, your ingredients and maybe list a few of the ingredients, but if you wanted to go into maybe your top three or five ingredients and say why these are so special and why you made a point of including them and what they're going to do for your customers, then you want to, um, then the description allows you to create a short bulleted list, highlight those, uh, those ingredients without having to sacrifice on um, on weird formatting or creating a really long bullet point that would be off-putting or whatnot. So the description actually gives you a lot more creative space to present your product's information in a way that is approachable, digestible, and makes sense to your customer. Perfect. Yeah, that's brilliant advice. And I think, you know, more and more people are moving to mobile. So definitely we got to take that into consideration. So I, I wanted to you know, thank you so much, Emma, for your time and this uh, super informative training today. And for um, the people that want to connect with you, uh, I, I see that you already shared the, the URL for the free listing optimization worksheet. And I'm going to drop that in the chat for people that want to check it out. It's marketingbyemma.com slash Gary. And I see you also have uh, your contact info. So uh, what's the best way to connect? So on our website, we have contact form. We also, uh, we offer free listing analysis. So just like what we did with the teardown, if you didn't, if you felt funny about submitting it for a public chat and but you would like our opinion you can submit that through our website and we're happy to take a look at your listing and give you some of our observations about things that you may want to consider um, also reachable by email uh, on our Facebook page facebook.com slash marketing by Emma um, phone if you prefer phone that phone number is also available on whatsapp so really whatever whatever form of communication is comfortable for you, we're probably there. Excellent, this is brilliant. And then one last question before we let you go, Emma. Um, <laughs> I'm curious, I mean, copywriting is such a broad and deep topic. Are there any books that you would recommend for you know people that wanna like, you know, dive more into and learn more into this? So that's a great question and my, my answer may be a little bit non-traditional. There are plenty of books that talk about writing, but I think the best way to become a good writer is to write. It's like any other skill where you really need to practice it. So whether you're learning an instrument or learning how to cook, you're going to have to, to be okay with creating some poor writing 
in in the hopes of eventually getting better. So the books that I would recommend are actually much more about uh, things like human psychology, which can be really helpful in understanding how people make decisions, uh, what they think about, and then being able to utilize some of those ideas when you're making decisions, whether that be with your copy or your images or any of your other marketing. So one of my favorite psychology related books that I've read recently is Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a pretty bulky book, but it's really fascinating. Another really good one is Influence. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I have a, I keep a, a running list of all the books that I read because I don't know if any of you are like this. Whenever somebody asks me what books I've read lately, my mind just sort of goes blank. <laughs> so, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna. I don't mean to put you on the spot like this. <laughs> no, it's okay. I I love reading, and I'm also always. I if you have book recommendations, please share them. Um, what are some other good ones? One book that I read some time ago, and it's it was about copywriting. I think it was called the the Ultimate Sales Letter by Dan Kennedy. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if you've read that. But I think it was I... called the Ultimate Sales Letter. So it talks about you know direct marketing, and you know back in the days, you know before the internet, people would like mail stuff, right? So yeah. Like, you know, like how to get people to keep reading until the end, and uh, a lot of these hacks with the headlines. I think it's still totally relevant. I mean, like the content is still. I mean, the principles are still there. We're just like yes. swapping the, the medium, right? Exactly. So, um, yeah. I, I agree completely. I would say that um, really a lot of the best copywriting books out there are the old classics, you know, things like Breakthrough, Advertising, um, the, the Hall of... I'm gonna yeah, embarrass Halpert. myself. Gary Halpert, Halpert and he had the letters, yeah. yeah. Um, so all of those sorts of texts, if you're just wanting to see some of like where the copy greats co came mm. from and then understanding how you're going to need to modify that for somewhere like Amazon. You know, because some of this really long form sales letters doesn't work on Amazon if you're just trying to copy and paste it. So you'll need to think a little bit deeper and try to understand what are some of these principles that they're using and how can you apply those to the channel that you're on and also to the modern consumer. Because one of the other things that I always try to be mindful of is, and, and something that happens a lot when you're trying to write your own copy and you may not be very experienced, is it's really easy to fall into kind of like marketing speak, which I I characterize as that like late night infomercial sort of um, yeah. writing that sounds over the top too, too much with what they're saying, like how they think that marketing should sound. And most customers don't like that kind of writing anymore, particularly when you're selling a product somewhere like Amazon, that is not the correct space for it. And so being mindful of really focusing on um, the, the core features and benefits of your product rather than trying to, you know, do some of these over the top tactics that just may not be correctly suited to Amazon in particular. Uh, some other good books that I think have, you know, copy is just writing is just, it's like a, it's, it's sales, but it's in writing form. So sales books can also be really great tools for improving your copy skills. So like the classic, um, Secrets of Closing the Sale by Zig Ziglar is a great mm -hmm. book and, and has a lot of fantastic info. So that may be another one worth exploring if you haven't listened to it. Yeah. Or read yeah, it rather. Great. Yeah. <laughs> if you, uh, I, I guess, auto you owe or not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I've listened to uh, Zig Ziglar's audiobook and that guy, he was like a world-class speaker, just like his energy level and his I encourage you guys to, to take a listen if you get a chance. I mean, he's, he's passed away already, but uh, yeah, he's but like he's, one of the legends. Exactly. Yeah. 
yeah, it's a great it's a great book. I would recommend it to anybody that wants to learn and understand more about uh, sales, which you know, sales and marketing are are very much one in the same. So awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emma. This has been fantastic. It's been super value packed. Uh, I got a lot out of it. I'm sure our, our viewers did as well. So um, I encourage you guys and also thank you guys for watching. I encourage you if you want to learn more about um, copywriting or getting some help from Emma or getting that free analysis, uh, please visit her site uh, marketing by Emma.com slash Gary and also get your free analysis marketing by Emma.com slash Free, uh, free analysis. And then if this is helpful, uh, if you can please um, hit the like button or hit the subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube, that helps us. It keeps us going. So um, so thanks again. And, uh, and it's great to see you again, Emma. I wish great you all the best. Great to see you too. Thank yeah. you so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, it's our pleasure. So <laughs> take care and we'll keep in touch. All right. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.